it's the story of grasses. And I want to emphasize the story. And the reason for that is that, um, well, we'll see it in a moment. If you look at Africa, it has a lot of grass, more than any other continent. And uh, they're the forests, these darker, deep greens. But the rest of Africa has these lighter greens, browns, and yellows. And that is all grass. In some way, grass is part of the ecosystem. Um, interestingly, Madagascar is rather similar with uh, also a very grassy island. So what we can see is uh, it wasn't always this way, according to the another story, the deforestation story. So I've taken this map from YouTube, where it's been seen nearly uh, 2.7 million times, unlike our scientific papers, which have seen just a fraction of that amount. And this is the common idea behind forests. Forests were very extensive. They covered all huge areas of Africa and uh, across Europe and so on. Until humans began to chop them down and forests were reduced from 60 to 30 million square kilometers by this massive orgy of deforestation. We know this in, in Europe from historical accounts. We think that this is the same thing going on in other parts of the world, or some people think that. And we, we do have real evidence for this in the 20th century. We can see the forest losses because we have satellite imagery like this. And uh, you can see the massive impact of human settlements gobbling up nature. And in the Amazon, we can see what happens when you put a road through, the side roads develop, and these herringbone patterns of deforestation are a major concern. So the question is, how do we know about what happened before the 20th century, when we didn't have aerial photographs, where we didn't have satellite images, then people didn't even have a common definition of what is a forest. So how do you define whether the forests have diminished? So when you see a landscape like this, this has been interpreted, this is Gabon, uh, Lope Reserve, and you see this mosaic of forests and grassy savannas. And the existence of these grasslands, when you have forests like this, has been considered to be the result of deforestation. Now, what you see in this landscape is there are no people around. There's no sign of heavy cultivation, of old roads, of old settlements. So this must have happened a long time ago, this uh, deforestation. How long ago did you get that deforestation? And to find that out, I, we, we can go to South Africa. Now, here's that little map from that global uh, pattern. And you'll see that all here, this, this green here, was forest. And uh, it's been deforested according to this analysis. And if you look at a map of South Africa's biomes, these are the grassy biomes of South Africa, savannas around the edges, and these are all grasslands. When you see a landscape like this in the Drakensberg, there's a huge patch of forest there, but right next door to it is a proteus savanna and a grassland. And high up in the Drakensberg, where it's the wettest in the summer rainfall areas that we have, instead of a huge tall forest, we have grassland. So the early ecologists like John Acox thought that these areas were forests until humans introduced fire and iron, iron axes and the metal, the wood needed to, to make iron spears, armies. And in the process, they converted huge areas of forest to the grassland. So all this area here now was forest. Now these cultures, Iron Age cultures first settled in South Africa around 1500 to 2000 years ago. So that means all of this grassland is less than 2000 years old. And this is the story. Is there a counter story? Is there a different story? 
And from the 1980s, a different story began to emerge. And uh, this is a, one of the areas which has been interpreted as being the product of Iron Age uh, deforestation. These were all forests, it was believed. And you can see the old smelting, evidence of smelting all over the place. And all that use of wood led to deforestation and these grasslands and savannas developing. Well, is this true? And uh, we began to develop clues to tell us just how old the vegetation is. You could do it with pollen. Uh, pollen collects in swamps or wetlands. And the older, the deeper you go, the older the pollen source. So you can easily separate grass pollen from tree pollen. And by analyzing a core stuck into a, a wetland, you can tell whether it was forest and whether it's become grassland, as you might expect. In the 1980s, a new uh, method evolved, and this is based on carbon isotopes. It's a chemical signal of vegetation. And you can tell the difference between sun-loving grasses, C4 grasses, what we call them, versus shrubs and trees, which are C3. And uh, when the plants drop their leaves or when the roots decay, their decomposing soil organic matter stays in the soil as an echo of the vegetation that was there. And the deeper you go, the older the layers from ancient vegetation. And the advantage over pollen is that you don't need to find a swamp to go and look for it. You can do it. You can use this technique wherever soils are deep enough. It has problems, but it also has wonderful uses. So here you go, you dig a soil pit, and then the idea would be that the carbon, the isotopic carbon at the top there comes from grasses, it's the most recent. As you go deeper, you're going into older and older and older vegetation. So if these grasses pushed aside those forests there, because of deforestation, then at the bottom, we should find forest carbon and grass carbon only in the top. So this just illustrates that idea. Under the forest, we'll find forest carbon all the way down because the forests are ancient. If we go to the grassland, we'll find grass carbon right at the surface and forest carbon all the way down. So what do we find? Huh. That's what we should get. What we actually found was at under the forest, the deeper soil was all from grass carbon. All the forest had been grassland. And under the grassland, there was no sign at all of forest carbon. So what a shock. The grasslands are ancient. And the forests are the new colonizers. That really rattled our prior conceptions. And we had to start thinking hard. And similar mosaics of forests and grasslands, forests and grasslands occur all over the place. This is in South Africa. This is in Gabon. This is in Madagascar, just after a fire. And notice that the fire didn't burn the forest down. It stopped the edges, which is typical of all these forest margins. And this one's in North America. And the more we look at the age of the grasslands and the forests, we find that the grasslands are ancient, much, much older than we would expect from deforestation. So how do grasslands replace forests? And I put it to you as a question. Grasses are small, weak, no big trunk to lift them up. They hate shade. And even their own shade is lethal to them. So how do grasses sweep forests aside? You can see it if you look in the typical fire type grass and you look at the base, you see all this dead grass lying around and the new grass shoots start right at the bottom and they've got to push their way through this dead decomposing grass to get into the life and grow. Trees, of course, don't do that. All the new growth is in the top of the shoots or in the side. 
Whereas a poor old grass with the new shoots has to break its way through the dead litter. So it's a, it's a ridiculous design. And it's hard to imagine any sensible uh, molecular biologist coming up with a design that's so poor and yet so successful. The good things about grass is that they recover fast from defoliation. If you cut that leaf, it regrows quickly. And another advantage for them is that they have fine roots that fill the soil around them and allow them to compete with trees. But their real secret is if there are a few million assembled into a few billion and the billions assembled into trillions, then the whole battle changes. And the little Davids who were beaten up by the Goliath forest now suddenly have powerful allies in the form of massive consumers, fire and the big mammal grazers. This is what rescues the grasses from oblivion. Grasses love fire. And herbivores love grasses. This is a massive herd of wildebeest crossing the Serengeti. And frankly, Grasses love herbivores. These are not the same grasses as the ones that love fire. It's different grasses. Lawn grasses capable of spreading under very heavy grazing. Um, and representing and showing us that grasses come in different forms. Broadly speaking, fire type grasses and grazing lawn type grasses. So how do trees cope in these grassy environments? And uh, the trouble for, for trees when it comes to browsing is going from a seedling up to an adult. And you have to get tall enough to escape the browsers. Um, and if you do, if you grow too slowly, you'll never escape. And if there are enough browsers, you'll never escape. And in this way, grasslands can replace forests. Fire is very similar um, as a consumer. The little saplings have to grow above the flame zone. And if they can do that, they can grow into tall trees. But it's a lethal area here. And depending on how fast they grow and how frequently fires occur, um, they, you can have very few trees or you could have a woodland developing. Forest trees are very different from savanna trees in a number of ways. They have thin bark whereas these savanna trees have thick bark. They have shallow roots because the nutrients are in the top surface of the soil, where savanna nutrients are deeper down. Their buds are very vulnerable, damage from fire. They have no insulation on them. And the biggest uh, difference is they invest heavily in leaves. And the leaves cast a deep shade. That deep shade excludes shade intolerant grasses, the C4 grasses, so there's no grass that it is here. And that means fire really struggles to penetrate. And there's nothing much going for grazing animals. They need that heavy growth of leaves to keep neighbors out of their canopy space. So uh, forest trees by their nature cast a lot of shade, utterly different from a savanna tree which allows light through and the grasses can grow perfectly well underneath it. So here you can visually see the problem for a small savanna tree. If it's below that flame zone, then the above ground parts get killed in a fire. The plant itself usually doesn't get killed, it just re-sprouts. But the problem for a tree is to get high enough to escape this. And if it's a forest tree, they're very, very poor at getting through that flame zone. The valid trees have learned some tricks and are able to do so. so we've known about this sort of uh, problem for a long time. We've known that fire is very influential and we have been running experiments manipulating fire for a century. This one in Kruger has been going on for uh, more than half a century now. 
And here you see the results of burning every year for more than 50 years, just across the, the, the path here, the road. It looks like this, and the savannah is turning into a forest. So the climate is suitable for forest care. And the reason that it's not a forest all over the northern wetter parts of Kruger is because of frequent fires. If you go in the drier parts of Kruger, this is burnt frequently every two years or so. This is where fires have been removed for a long time. It's much, much slower to form a forest, but fire is still very influential in influencing the trees. And the extraordinary thing here is that this is in the face of elephants. Elephants are all over the place here and all the other herbivores, but fire remains a very influential consumer of biomass. So here we go. This is elephants, absolute vandals, smashing down trees, ripping up the bark, uh, making a big mess of things, wonderful creatures, <laughs> and uh, munching trees with great uh, gusto. And we know that elephants are very influential. Um, this is a remarkable LIDAR picture from Kruger National Park. This is an exclosure which has protected the trees within the exclosure since the 1970s. And here is what elephants have done to it in that uh, the last 50 years or so. And they, this single species has opened up this vast savanna. The question, though, is whether elephants could have driven back forests. Can they turn a forest into a savanna? And there I'm much more skeptical. And we'll see more in a moment. The animals that are really lethal for um, forest trees and savanna trees are these browsers, like we could do, and impala. Impala particularly because they eat grass and browse trees. So their numbers grow because of the huge environment of grass. And they then, in the dry season, will switch to browse and fatten trees. They're enormously influential animals. And they are capable of rolling back forests by eating up not the adults, but the juveniles. Here's an example. Uh, you can see this is definitely not an elephant-proof fence. It was uh, produced by us without the aid of all Kruger's expertise. And out here is uh, Impala and Anyala and so on. And this is what happens when you keep them out. So these little animals with their small jaws can really home in and flatten trees. They've done this for a long time. And we know it not only in Africa, but all over the world. What is new? is realizing that fire and mammal herbivores are globally important in creating these open, non-forested, grassy ecosystems. So here's this huge area of Africa, full of lots and lots of grass. And why is it so grassy? Because of the climate and because of the ancient actions of fire and large herbivores. If we could eliminate all the herbivores and switch off fire, Africa would have a great deal more forest, is the argument. So what kinds of climates are uh, typical of these mosaic landscapes where you have forests and savannas? And we know, we have some idea about this from a famous uh, plant ecologist who 50 years ago tried to look at where the way major biomes of the world could be placed on a rainfall and temperature plane. And uh, there's a rainforest, there's seasonal rainforest, there's taiga and tundra. But in this zone here, he actually said, I don't know what you can get. You can get grasslands, you can get savannas, you can get shrublands, you can get woodlands, you can get forests. Uh, it's people like to sometimes say it's the grass and climate zone. That's not what Whitaker said. He said basically you can't predict what you're going to find here. So that is where ecosystems are uncertain. That is the climate. The climate that provides the stage 
but what you find on the stage, what the play is, what goes on in the theater, depends on which creatures, which processes are most important within that space. If you extrapolate that climate over the world, you'll see that it's vast. The climate stage for uncertain ecosystems where climate is not a direct predictor of ecosystem is truly vast. And it's particularly vast in Africa, South America and North America. But of course, I just uh, see Africa here. Um, the open ecosystems, by looking at it in, with uh, diff different ways, cover about one third of the vegetated land surface of the world. They're not a minor issue. They are a major part of the uh, nature of the world. This is a satellite image of fire. So this also helped us enormously once we started getting satellite imagery of fire to recognize just how potent the effects of these consumers can be. Just look here at uh, Africa, for example, at where you have these uncertain climates, and you'll see that this is where the fires are most prominent. Uh, the redder the, the, the color, the more frequent the fires. And Africa, um, the grassiest continent, accounts for something like 70% of the world's annual burnt area. If you could switch fire off, we would have a lot more forest. Fires are started by humans, right? And humans and fire are agents of environmental destruction. If we look at these heavily grazed areas, what I've been calling grazing lawns, they just overgrazed, badly managed rangelands, right? The farmer could be uh, um, prosecuted for damaging the land. It's humans that have deforested Africa, humans using fire, humans trashing the world with their livestock. Um, but this is all true. Fires are started by humans. Now, grazing lawns are created by heavy grazing. But what if these fires and the animals that open up the forest are much, much older than deforestation by humans? Then we'd have to acknowledge that the impacts of fires and, and mammals are natural, perfectly natural. And we have to accept that in our thinking about conservation, protected areas, and how we need to manage them. So we're looking at millions of years ago. Grasslands are millions of years old and much older than our hominid ancestors. How do we know this? Well, there are fossils out there, ancient fossils of uh, grazing animals. Very few fossil grasses, unfortunately. What we've been able to add to the picture in the last few years is molecular phylogeny, which give us a new way of exploring when things happened in the past. So let's look at how we've used uh, those phylogenies to try and look at how old are our African savannas. And our first work was with uh, the fire savannas of Africa. Now, unfortunately, the fire dependent savannas are typically in wetter areas, higher rainfall, and uh, you don't get fossils developing easily there. So there's no record of uh, very few records of ancient charcoal on the land. We can pick up charcoal in the sea, in the marine sediments. So that gives us some guide to what was happening with fire on the land. With these phylogenies, it's the it's the uh, the tree of life. We can estimate dates from a molecular phylogeny, and uh, they can show us when plants that only occupy frequently burnt savannas first began to appear. So, which plants did we look at? Well, we looked at underground trees, and uh, they were first written about by Frank White, an Oxford ecologist. He talked about the underground forests of Africa. Uh, that's a, a phrase 
to capture the imagination. Underground trees are dwarf trees and they're restricted to frequently burnt savannas and harsh growing conditions. The harsh growing conditions make them grow slowly and the frequent fires makes it very difficult for them to grow into trees. So we use underground trees as our indicator of frequently burnt savannas, which occupied enough land to provide habitat for these underground trees. And then we use the phylogeny to date when they diverged from their taller tree ancestors. So this is what an underground tree looks like in a coastal grassland in Zululand. Pretty boring, right? What you need is to try and look through the skin of the surface here and see what's beneath. And this is what this Australian artist has done in this magnificent picture of there's the skin of the soil. There's the fires burning the grasslands and uh, just the tips of the branches of the underground trees sticking through the soil. But the real tree is below ground in this uh, amazing illustration is, that would do justice to Lord of the Rings. Um, that's the artist's impression. The uh, sadly, it's, it's probably more boring like this where you have the branches just below the soil surface, the shoots that stick up, fires come along, uh, the shoots, tips of the shoots re-sprout rapidly, flower and fruit. So it's like you somebody has grabbed the stem of a tree and pulled it down until just the tips of the crown show up above the soil surface. They're only growing grasslands, they never grow in forests, and they grow in places that burn several times in a decade and where growing conditions are poor. And this slow growth prevents their escaping from the flames and seems to have selected for this dwarf behavior. Here's some examples. This is a gardenia. If you imagine holding onto that trunk and pulling hard until just the leaves stick up above the soil, you're going to get that. So this is the underground version of a gardenia, an underground tree. Here's the underground protea, but my favorite one is this uh, cabbage tree. And here's a magnificent old cabbage tree. And somebody's grabbed the trunk here over evolutionary time, pulled it and pulled it and pulled it until just the tips of the leaves and the flowering and fruiting shoots stick, about, stick up above the soil. This is an underground tree. And all underground trees have a close relative that's an ordinary tree. This is a lovely example that I got from Brazil in a Brazilian savanna. And you can see the canopies of these underground trees can grow very large. And you can see why it's an advantage to be an underground tree rather than just to be a shrub. These shrubs never grow into tall trees in this environment, but they only have a small surface area to make flowers and fruit, whereas this underground tree can produce masses of flowers and fruit, and therefore uh, has an advantage in the evolutionary race to leave more progeny. The very interesting thing about th this species is that uh, one individual has been dated by Brazilian researchers to around 3,800 years old. They're ancient tree, older than our giant bear We just don't recognize them because they, they're on the ground, growing with the grasses. But if you find one of these in our African grasslands, and it's as old as 3,800 years, that's nearly twice the age, more than twice the age of uh, the settlement of Iron Age farmers in South Africa and would immediately um, cast doubt on the theory that a grassland was created by people. So what we did was uh, to, this is the work of Michelle van der Bank and her wonderful team. They're producing a, a molecular DNA phylogeny of a whole lot of trees in Africa. And with the genius of Jonathan Davies, we could look at when an underground tree evolved in compared to its nearest uh, tree relative. 
And these are the dates we got. Now I'd say the first thing to notice is this axis is millions of years. So these trees, these underground trees first evolved, oh, somewhere around between seven and 10 million years ago, with a massive surging increase in the last few million years. So our high rainfall savannas are ancient. They really are ancient. But the second thing to notice is that, well, everything seemed to have got together in the last 7 million years. So they're not that ancient. But can you believe this sort of stuff? Is this uh, funny um, data from molecular phylogeny? Does it have any real uh, uh, fossil evidence to support it? And we do. We have marine charcoal. And here's an example of marine charcoal near the tropics. And uh, going back 20 million years, and you see there has been a bit of fire around. And then from around 7 million years, which is more or less where our underground trees begin, we have this absolute explosion of charcoal. The world began to burn. And the same is true, but even sooner in other parts further north. The increased fire activity has been general around the world from about 7 million years ago. Why? Well, that's one of those mysteries. So the fire idea, we now have a pretty good idea that fires are ancient, but not that ancient. The savannas are comparatively new in Earth's history. What about the mammals? And uh, I must admit that I thought mammals were latecomers. Now they would have a different origin because there's no link with fire here. We need a different marker to tell us when we're dealing with a mammal savanna. There are good fossil records of mammals because they are common in rare uh, dry localities. We can tell their diet from carbon isotopes and whether they were eating grass from scratch marks on their teeth. But would browsing be enough to drive back forest? So ideally, we need a marker of mammals and a marker of savannas. And here was our choice, trees with spines. Spiny plants are uniquely defended against mammals. And there are lots of spiny plants in Africa. As you all know, uh, you should at least give a few drops of your blood when passing through any decent savanna and watching mammals and birds. So we took a look at uh, 1,852 African tree species. And we tried to see uh, where they grow. Um, and uh, what are the rainfall, what are the soil characteristics, what herbivores are present. We were able to do that from some other very recent research. And the answers were spiny species are most common where you have antelope as being grazers or browsers, and typically medium sized to large antelope browsers. So impala, gazelles, up to kudu. Um, are common where spiny trees are common. It's, it, I should say that it's pretty strange that the best defended plants in terms of spiny plants are also the ones that are most eaten. And that is another mystery that uh, we, we currently are beginning to explore. Fascinating that uh, the spiny plants are the ones which are most common in the diet of these browsers. Another very important thing is that the spiny trees are dominant in savannas and open grassy biomes. And there are no spiny plants in the forest, none at all in the forests of the Congo, for example. And they occur in dry regions on fertile soils. So could we use the origin of spiny trees like we did for um, the underground trees and uh, to see when 
savannas began to spread. And in the same way that we compared the underground tree dates with charcoal in the ocean, can we see whether the, the, the uh, evolution of spiny trees is paralleled by the evolution of antelope browsing? So does it happen together? If it happens apart, then we, we don't really know whether the mammals drove the evolution and whether the evolution of spiny trees drove the mammals. So here we use this molecular phylogeny again with some additions. And uh, we first looked at the lineage, it's called bovids here, but these are basically antelope. And uh, this is the number of lineages, and this is the, the time, going back 140 million years to today. And what we first found was uh, the antelope only get to Africa about 16 million years ago, and then they go crazy, just uh, exploding into all the kinds of species we know today. If we look at plants, non-spiny plants, the species numbers increase over time in a fairly uh, linear way on this log scale. If we look at the spiny trees, there aren't any. For millions and millions of years, there are almost no spiny plants and the, until the mammals arrive, and then these, until the antelope arrive, and then these spiny trees go crazy. And we think this is clear evidence that the two are related. Bring in the antelope and more spiny trees evolve, bring in spiny trees and more antelope evolve. So this tells us that spiny plants began to create savannas from about 16 million years ago. But for 30 million years before then, there were no spiny species. That is a big surprise. I thought spines were a general defense against mammals with their soft cheeks. But no, spiny plants only evolved when antelope reached Africa. And we think how it works is that the impala and the kudus and so on and their predecessors browsed the young seedling. They couldn't knock over the big trees, but they could eat up their seedling like great lawnmowers penetrating the forest. And then the really surprising thing for me is that arid savannas were even older than the fire dependent savannas. And that was a shock. The Africa was an island for at least 30 million years um, before antelope arrived. And during that long 30 million year period, the dominant herbivores eating plants in Africa when there were no spines were dassies, aracoids. Uh, here's a giant one, and you can see it's the same sort of body shape, disgusting looking thing, big, about the size of a, a small black rhino. And they made herds, apparently, and these herds of big dussies, uh, smaller ones than this, wandered around eating the plants. And the other great uh, component of the ancient African fauna were the proboscidean. Elephants and their relatives began in Africa. This is their home. This is where they started. And for 30 million years, when the world was dominated in Africa by these herbivores, no spiny trees at all. So what happened? Here's Africa as an island, and it drifted north with continental drift, bumped into Eurasia, and the antelope in the bovis crossed over into Africa. This bumping happened about 18 million years ago, and we see that the, the mammals and the spiny plants take off from about 16 million. The mammals are pathetic at dispersing uh, across oceans. They need the land connections. And at the same time, all the proboscideans, the elephants, spread out into the rest of the world, creating mammoths, mastodons, gompotheres, dinotheres, uh, having a great time in the rest of the world, but starting from Africa. So this is what we think was going on. I, I found this amazing.
what a great story. Eh? Um, and it's it's got some scientific credibility, let me add. It's not only a story. And so we have this wonderful diversity of antelope capable of feeding on spiny plants, but also the spiny plants able to protect themselves against the antelope with their spines. So here's the summary story that we have. Uh, this represents carbon dioxide, which is part of the game. Here's temperature, which could also be part of the game. C4 grasses we know from diverse evidence uh, were around a long time ago, but really only took off from about seven or eight million years ago. And that is when charcoal begins to get prominent and when underground trees begin to radiate. Then we have this really surprising work of the bovids arriving of spiny trees being absent in Africa for long periods until the arrival of the bovids, the antelope, and suddenly spiny trees evolved and the bovids fill up the world. So in both cases, whether it's a fire savanna or an arid mammal dominated savanna, savannas are millions of years old, millions of years old. But there was a time when there weren't any back in the past, even though climate were not that different. So from a largely forested world, say 55, 50 million years ago, a new grassy world emerged. And this new open sunlit habitat was just full of wonderful opportunities, like these wildebeest just exploding on the savanna plain. You just put your head down and walk it, and there's your food. Amazing. And it's so much harder for predators to get close to you and eat you. So uh, a whole host of new mammal species evolving to exploit these new conditions. And many African mammals, the bigger mammals, the ones that we think of as, as our unique heritage, are open habitat species. They're not forest species. They like the sun on their back. Now, uh, I'm pleased to see there were birders in the audience. If they're still there, I would like to see more comparisons of the diversity of grassland birds, birds that uniquely depend on grassland versus birds that uniquely occupy forests. From this poster from Kruger, there seem to be an awful lot of birds in those savannas, and they're far, far fewer in the Niza forest with a whole bunch of them being water birds. So it's just generally true. Um, you think that forests are rich in birds, but are they just as rich or even richer in savannas if you move around with that? And then of course, there were new opportunities for plants. And uh, here's some old growth coastal grasslands, and they have underground trees in them, which are brand new uh, creatures, plants that uh, exploit the new environments. And if you look closely here, you'll see lots of little plants flowering. There are literally thousands of plant species that love the sun and love fire and they cope with fire very easily. They are now sit in our grassland. Here's a montane grassland. And if you look here, it's hard to call it a grassland. There's so many non grassy forbs, herbaceous plants that we call forbs. Beautiful flowering things. We, we are so rich in forb species. And again, these plants are all flowering in their first season after fire. So there are thousands of these flowering plants dependent on the sun. And they endemic to South Africa and they endemic to the habitat of grasslands. And if the forests were spread, you would eliminate all of these many thousands of species. Fascinating to dig them up. A little uh, scruffy little um, vegetable above ground turns out to have these massive underground roots. So we had a lot of fun digging up these little plants see what they have below ground. And they have these huge stores of uh, carbon that allows them to recover very quickly after fire. So looking at this, you've got to ask yourself, why are these open non-forested ecosystems considered deforested 
as I began this talk, degraded and worthless, particularly by uh, within Europe, where there's this massive push to cover the world with trees. And I think everyone has their extraordinary cultural blinkers. Uh, celebrate the grass and celebrate the views. I think South Africans do this. We, uh, our hearts are filled with joy when we see our mountains covered with grass. If they were covered with trees, you wouldn't be able to see the mountains at all. For ecologists, I think there's a problem with our conceptual framework. Intrinsically, although we, we can argue with this academically, the idea is that succession proceeds after a disturbance, after a forest has been chopped down. The little guys, like grasses, come in, prepare the soil and so on. They're shaded out by bigger guys that are shaded out by bigger guys. And eventually the whole system stops when there's so much shade cast by the forest trees and they themselves are the only species that can uh, recruit in the shade. So A goes to B goes to C goes to D, and then E is the climax, which replaces itself. There's a fatal flaw in this kind of reasoning. And this is that the plants, these plants, have evolved to reduce their chances of offspring surviving. So their babies are not going to be able to grow in the environment that they create. And that uh, really doesn't seem to fit with what we know about uh, evolution. So what if these little guys could be sneaky and could prevent the trees from moving in so that you get a cycle maintaining the little guys and a different cycle maintaining the trees? And with powerful allies, as I've argued here, mammals and fire, this is what you can do. So instead of this successional sequence, we have what are now called alternative stable states. The alternative states, because they can occur on the same environment, the same climate, same soils, but very different in their properties, grasslands or shrublands versus closed forests. And they're stable. They can last for thousands of years, as we saw in that very first example from Kasui using stable aspects of carbon. Early successional doesn't seem to be a good descriptor of grasslands that can persist for thousands of years. So now we're beginning to think in these terms, a new idea. And uh, an important aspect of this new idea is that uh, plants and animals are not passive responders to the environment in which they find themselves. They change the environment and they change the environment in a way that helps to promote their continued existence in that environment. We call it a feedback. And common feedbacks favoring savannas are the grasses being highly flammable, promoting fire, or highly palatable, promoting herbivores. So the herbivores come back and come back and come back and the fire comes back in the flammable. We have flammable grasses. They create conditions that are hotter and drier and more nutrient poor, especially with frequent fire, than forests. And that slows the forest seeding growth and their ability to grow out of harm's way. Then there are these common feedbacks favoring forests. Shade, a potent, absolutely potent killer uh, environmental shift created by forests. It kills out savanna grass, it kills out all those thousands of orbs, and kills out the thousands of savanna trees just by adding shade. And if anyone's been walking in the in the windy day today in Cape Town, they'll know that if you walk into a forest, there's no wind. And that change to no wind in a more humid climate stops the movement of fires right near the forest edge. You also in forests exclude savanna mammals. I think largely by not only the absence of grass to feed on, but uh, by fear of predation, so that the uh, devices, the ways in which animals escape predators in grasslands do not work in a forest. The trees provide lots of opportunity to hide. 
kind of thing. So this story that I started with is the wrong story. And this story has been the one that justifies planting forests where there never were any. So we need to be very cautious when we confront a story like this, even when there are 2,700 views of the story. You're not to believe it, believe me, no, just easy. But uh, unfortunately, what's happened with this story is um, there are these international programs, such as the Bond Challenge, and this deeper orange here is their plan where they say these are perfect conditions to reforest Africa. What they really mean is you can plant an awful lot of trees in these savannas, and savannas are worthless anyway, so this is a nice thing to be able to do. In Europe, there seems to have been genuine deforestation, and they, when they, if they have forest reforestation plans there, they are actually reforesting the area. So it becomes critically important where you decide to plant trees and restore forest landscapes. In Africa, there haven't been forests for millions of years. So when I see things like this, plant trees save the world, save our planet, plant a tree, uh, and Ethiopia breaking the tree planting record, I, I hang my head in sorrow. This is the end of our wonderful open grassy world, rich with all the life that loves the sunlight. This is what's gonna happen. This is what it really means. This fancy idea of forest is not a forest as you might think of them. What they're doing is converting this old growth grass and crammed full of a wonderful plant species with its animal species to this eucalypt. We know how to grow eucalypt. So this is the forest that will replace this. And when you decide this is horrific and we don't want any more forests, you end up with a degraded secondary grassland in which the original diversity never seems to come back. We've looked at these systems that were under forest 20 to 40 years after the trees have been removed and they still have not recovered to their original condition. Here's some data just showing how long it's been since the forest has been removed and the number of species. And this shows what the forests are doing. They recover with no problem. This is showing the grasslands, and that was their original condition. And after nearly 20 years, they're still not even close to the original patterns of diversity. So to end this talk, what I urge you to do is when you support the tree planting project, and you should do. Planting trees does make sense in some places where there were forests before. It makes sense to plant trees in cities to reduce the heat and to provide shade. But when you support a tree planting project, stop, think, are the trees restoring a forest or are they destroying an ancient grassland? and destroying the creatures that love the sun. What might be lost? Ask awkward questions. And when Africa gets under pressure to plant trees all over the place, which it is buckling to do, let us plant at least the right trees in the right place and for the right reason. And this sums up really what I wanted to say. It was an old honor student of mine at UCT. This is the Africa that was. Is this the Africa that we're moving into, that we're becoming? And this is considered beneficial to the environment. And it demonstrates people who have completely the wrong story. So for you, I hope you'll uh, accept that the grass story is a different one. And for the short story, you can have a look here, or here, and for a longer story, you can have a look here. Thanks very much. Thank you. So, Bill Ritmiller had a wonderful question, but I do believe that um, Dr. Bond answered that at the end of his talk. She was uh, asking about planting billions of trees. Um, but I think Dr. Bond, especially for Africa, 
gave a brilliant example and answer there. Uh, maybe one of Gustav Roos, many questions. <laughs> Gustav, you have been busy. Uh, um, he, uh, in some point he agreed, but in some cases, and I'm reading the question now, Dr. Bond, in, uh, but in some cases, why does bush encroachment occur in some savanna systems, even with fire and Fraser browsers and mixed feeders? Was the fire applied at the wrong type uh, or at the wrong time of year? Or was the fire not intense enough due to the insufficient fuel load to achieve top kill of the trees? Or is it due to overgrazing or browsing? Or is it a combination of incorrect grazing and browsing and burning management practices. There's also some theories the trees are better at capturing carbon dioxide than grasses, but not sure if this is correct. Wow. No, it's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> PhD. <laughs> yeah. no, he, uh, he clearly knows all about it anyway. Um, so it's a, complicated, uh, it's a complicated answer because it varies in different places. Um, my own view is that uh, the, it's, it's happening worldwide, the, the bush encroachment, and I consider it one of the major threats um, to the future of savannas. And, uh, you know, some of the modeling work, looking at uh, the trends that we're seeing and trying to uh, explore the physiology suggests that there won't be savannas. Um, the grasslands will disappear and the trees by the end of the century, which is absolutely appalling. And I, I didn't want to talk about it because it's another story, but I think that a lot of it has to do with increasing CO2, the direct effects of carbon dioxide. Uh, plants can um, photosynthesize more effectively. They can capture more carbon and uh, they will continue to do so if they have somewhere to put that extra carbon. It's like a conveyor belt. And uh, if there's, if the, if the organs are already full, then the plant shuts down photosynthesis at the other end. The trees are designed to cope with fire and these forbs that have underground storage organs, they get packed with starch. So things like potatoes or other trees that have a place to store the surplus carbon are thriving uh, under high CO2. So I, I think it's one of the great costs of increasing CO2 is that we have tipped the balance between trees and grasses to the trees. And if our grandparents uh, were able to keep trees out by uh, using fire or herbivores in a particular way, their grandsons would no longer be able to do so because of these fundamental atmospheric changes. That's my... Um, argument, but uh, it's what I think is going on. I'm sure it's going on, but um, it's another story. Sorry, it's another talk altogether. <laughs> Let's ask Marty Jasper. Um, he, he had one in the chat for once. <laughs> um, it's a simple question. Is the plow breaker uh, Erythrina Zahiri an example of an underground tree? Yeah, you got it. That's <laughs> right. It's a very nice example. Uh, Another one that people might know from um, the Leidenberg area is Sisyphus. Uh, you know, the, there's a, normally we all know it as a tree and hate it when you get hooked up in it, but there's an underground tree version that you can see on the road verge just outside Leidenberg. It's a, it's a fascinating phenomenon. Yeah, but the Puch breaker, that's it, Eris Rana. Hi, William. Um, in many parts of the world, I've come across uh, situations where you have grassland and forest, uh, particularly in montane areas and coastal areas. And between them, there's a sort of an ecotone, almost a veil uh, in undisturbed areas. And we once did a survey in the Vernon Crooks Nature Reserve, and we found we just looked at families. And the family distribution in grassland, forest, and the veil uh, were completely different. Um, and uh, I've noticed in parts of uh, Cameroon, uh, Brazil, and other areas where I've been, that you, you, where you have these uh, things, lots of lianas, creepers, and a lot of fabaceae, um, any comment about their role 
in, in this sort of evolution between the two? We just published a paper on, on this and uh, in those forests in Gabon. And the, the forests and the, the trees on the margin are um, happy to grow in light and, uh, and they respond rapidly after they've been burnt. And they provide protection of the, of the forest so that fires really struggle to penetrate beyond that forest margin. And they are distinct taxonomically. They're different species from those that you find in the forest and they're different from those that you find gaps in the forest. So we begin, we're beginning to think, it's, it's only just the first paper that I know of that's saying this. So what you're saying is, is, uh, is terrific. You know, there's this apron of stuff around the forest, um, which is occupying a unique position, which is important for protecting forests from fire. Um, the people shouldn't bother to, to make fire breaks around patches of forest when they're burning. Fire is absolutely essential as a management tool in conserving Africa. And if you're dealing with a mosaic of forest and grasslands, burn it. Burn that grassland. You're not going to um, destroy the forest as long as you have that apron intact. So it's a very interesting phenomenon that we need to do uh, to understand it much better. So I'd just like to know um, this patch mosaic burning Will that be um, to the disadvantage of grasses or, or the grasses only like a hot intense fire that will kill the trees or give them a competitive advantage? Or should you have a combination of hot intense fires and mosaic, patch mosaic burning? Well, I, I would say um, it depends partly on circumstances, but there's a lot to be said for having um, some variability in the fire regime. Um, I think we're not burning enough in hot, late, late season burns. You know, we, we need to have more uh, highly intense burns. And I think that they're gonna become more and more important in future um, in controlling areas that are already densely bushed, trying to, to win back the grass. So we need to learn how to do it. And I, I take my hat off to the people at Kruger and Isaac Smith is one of these who, uh, who have been exploring experimentally with very intense burns, burning under conditions where people would normally go and hide in their swimming pool. Uh, they're going out there and actually putting really severe fires in. So under normal conditions, I would say more variable, but I think the future if we're going to maintain uh, savannas, we're going to have to learn how to burn really high intensity burns. From Llewellyn Taylor, is that the case then? How come Australia is the center of origin of Acacias, given that we only have uh, Bachelia and uh, Senegalia now, or am I a mixed up zoologist? <laughs> um, the uh, those Australian acacia clays are not the ancient ones, um, as I understand it. They're more derived. Uh, I don't want to go into the phylogeny. I call them acacias. And uh, I like to, because ecologically, they, they behave in a similar way, Vichelia and Senegalia. Although there are people who would argue that uh, they are distinct. They have distinct niches and they, um, they work together. But uh, I still call them acacias, and I'm in brackets, I'd say Virginia or Senegalia. Um, and as for Australian acacias, they're a different creature completely. They, interestingly enough, um, they do have some analogies to African acacias in making cages, but they don't have spines. There are hardly any spiny acacias like our African acacias. And we think it's because of the unique feeding behavior of macropods, kangaroos and wallabies. Kangaroos and wallabies feed with their arms, with their forearms. Ungulates, antelopes, can't. They've got to stick their face in and get pricked. And that's sore. And that's why spines work so well against antelope and ungulates. But they're useless against uh, kangaroos 
mm. or baboons mm. or primates for that matter. You know, you could see a baboon sitting on something as awful as the Acacia tortoise, plucking the leaves off. The spines um, with a hand, you can remove foliage from within the spines. So Australia is a very interesting test case, uh, but very poorly studied by the Australians. <laughs> Sorry if the Australians bit. William, I'm still trying to digest and, and absorb uh, the incredible change of paradigm you are demanding, actually, because I mean, all around the world, there's incredible move, billions of dollars go into uh, planting trees, red, uh, the Billion Trees Initiative of the World Economic Forum in Davos, which even Trump supported, yeah? And all these uh, tree planting projects all around the world. And where are the trees planted on very often uh, land which is considered bare, barren, uh, shrubland or grassland? And the destruction this would uh, mean, I mean, uh, there's a huge change of paradigm required if, if what you say uh, is, I mean, how, how to make it mainstream. And even, I mean, just right now, which I mentioned in the chat, there's a project being promoted in Germany to uh, achieve the Paris uh, targets. Yeah, coal plants have to be converted and powered with either gas, which of course is a very poor alternative, or biofuel, it's also a pure, poor alternative. And where does the biofuel come from? And there's one suggestion which has been analyzed positively by uh, BMZ, the Ministry of Economic uh, Cooperation and GTZ, GIZ, to uh, clear uh, land in Namibia, uh, shrubland, grassland, the size of Italy, to provide the fuel for one coal plant in, in Hamburg, in Germany. Yeah? And this would be subsidized with millions of, of, of euros. Yeah? This, this has been already cleared and is being negotiated. Uh, uh, shrubland the size of Italy in Namibia being cleared to provide biofuel for one coal plant in Germany to convert this from coal to uh, biofuel. I mean, this is simply scandalous. So how, how can we get I mean, the kind of expert opinion like yours into the discussion of that sort? Yeah, I mean, it's, people are still on a total different uh, planet when they propose such projects. So it's really, I mean, it's just a race against time to prevent this huge damage to, to be done. Thank you. I couldn't have summarized it better myself. Um, you, you, so this is really why the motivation for giving this talk to LCA, uh, I think it's as many people as possible need to be aware um, of these massive tree planting programs and the scientific flaws within them. And uh, the, to look behind the, uh, the story and find out what's really going on. Who is benefiting from this um, uh, diversion into tree planting? And there are more and more people who are beginning to become aware of the risks and the damage caused by this massive uh, move towards deforestation. But what worries me is that we have very little time. You know, within 10 years, you could cause enormous damage um, to planting trees everywhere. So we need to spread the message. I, I don't know. I, I would welcome uh, other people to take it on and uh, suggestions on, on what the best way is of um, making the other side of the picture clearer to everyone. And to the banks, to the World Bank, which is helping to support this, to governments. Uh, IUCN is supporting uh, um, tree planting on a massive scale. And I hope in a few weeks to be talking to a group of uh, IUCN people and uh, just to make them uneasy uh, about the scale and the potential damage that they're making. So thank you very much for your very clear summary of the problem. Thank you, William. Uh, must say I've got a bit of a headache trying to, uh, as Sibyl said, digest all of this. Um, I'm not a browser, so I, <laughs> I've just been trying to take it in my head. But um, yeah, I know it's, it's actually quite, quite scary. I mean, I, I think what mustn't be misunderstood from your talk is there shouldn't be a hate against trees. I mean, there's definitely protection of trees in their correct habitat that should be fought for. For example, Amazon rainforests, etc., that are being um, cut down by the minutes um, for um, 
and other areas that where, where deforestation is happening. So I think it's not a case of, because I think a lot of people are saying, okay, well, deforestation is happening, so let's plant trees in other places to make up for the deforestation. We need to stop deforestation and we need to stop degrassing as, at the same time. But certain habitats are what they are for a reason and we need to try and maintain that or continue that. I don't know if that uh, agrees with what you're saying. No, no, you, I think uh, you said it very well. It's, um, I'm not opposed to, to, uh, to planting trees. Uh, in the right place. It, the point is to find out about it. Don't uh, don't just sign off um, X number of dollars and send it off to plant a tree program without finding out where they're doing it. You know, and how knowledgeable are they? And um, there are plenty of places. As I began my talk, where it would be fantastic to plant trees uh, and to restore the biodiversity within those. And the, the recent studies are showing that where you did have a forest and you restore that forest, you get by far the best returns for carbon, carbon sequestration, reduce CO2. When you're planting eucalypts and pines, um, you get very poor returns. So there's lots of good reasons why we should restore forests, but first find out was it a forest. And then I would agree with you completely. I, my own garden has a lot of trees, <laughs> more than the other people in the suburb, because I love trees, but uh, yeah, in the right place. Okay, so um, I just must say, I'm completely fascinated by this discussion. And just to highlight my passions and the puzzles that I'm trying to piece in my own mind at the moment. So I come from a social impact, heritage and cultural tourism, um, community-based tourism background so this you know this is kind of like boggling in my brain about how this can possibly all work together and um, something that's very much on my mind having listened to what um, Prof Bond has said very much is about the cultural landscape um, so when we talk about tourism and cultural tourism and historic tourism the cultural landscape there's a particular person that defined this and I can't remember that, <laughs> that person right now we're gonna have to forgive me I'm gonna have to look the person up again to reference them but there's two parts there's a physical landscape and the cultural landscape and to me you've almost highlighted both in your talk so there's kind of the physical landscape which is the the grasslands and the trees and all that kind of stuff and there's also the cultural side of things that is also beautiful and that tourism conservation and heritage tourism and communities can i don't know can this work together somehow those are kind of like my thoughts for this future discussion thanks Chanel. that sounds great um one of the things I've been trying to do, I, I don't really know, I would love to know um, the history of this obsession with, with uh, trees. I think the source is Europe, but I'd love to be interested to know uh, which other cultures um, have this sort of forest fetish. And uh, um, what I've been trying to do is to find quotes from um, people talking beautifully about grasses and grass and, and the, the view you can get and reminding people of how magnificent uh, our grassy landscapes are. Uh, I've had visiting Australians who just completely gobsmacked by the Drakensberg, the most beautiful landscape they've seen with this great sweeping hills of uh, red colored grasses. So we need to find the poetry and, uh, and uh, the literature Alan Payton, you know, talking about the rolling hills uh, covered in grass, more beautiful than the singing of it. So let's celebrate uh, what we have. Um, and then we celebrate forests as well, but they both have a place in the sun. And uh, I think for people, I would be, it'd be absolutely marvelous if um, people explored the cultural side of uh, these peculiar attitudes to the environment. Uh, more fully, and if we uh, help to open people's eyes um, to to look at the view. <laughs> anyway, very nice to hear your opinion. Thank you. 